can make this available to people who can't be here today. <clears throat> I did just start the recording, but if anyone has objections, let me know. I can always delete it later if needed. So let me pull up the Mentimeter. Um, and also let me just drop this into the chat box. Um, I'm hoping that this works and I try to create an anonymous. Um, Form for people to fill um, to add their comments. I know sometimes with Google, it's like sometimes you might be prompted to log in, but hopefully it just comes up as an anonymous path across so bear or or something of that nature. So like um, you can add your question or comment there. Um, you can also send it to um, either Deborah, Melody, I forget who the other person that would be um, helping. Um, to for the session. Uh -oh. Let me this. Um, we'll So let me bring up Mentimeter so we can start seeing this. Um, oh, it's so sweet. Let me start sharing my screen. Can everyone see the Mentimeter uh, results? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. All right. Thank you. Um, And you can you can be feeling multiple things at once. Like I am excited, I am exhausted, I'm I'm grateful, um, you know, I am overwhelmed, um, hungry is legit. Um, and so like, you know, what are you what are you what are you feeling today? Kind of like what like how are you showing up? Like what are you bringing, you know, to this space here today? So just gonna give it one more, one more minute. And I just wanna say like, it is okay if you need to step away and come back. Um, I know that this is two hours. Um, I do have um, some breaks built in. Um, so, you know, there's no worries um, about that. But if you need to step away for any reason, or if you just need to like, need a break to stand up and stretch, please feel free to do so. So just gonna give it a few more section, seconds. Um, Let me see now. Now oh, let me see if I had another question and let me stop sharing and see if I can move on to that other question. This is the second time that I'm using a Mentimeter in a session. Um, and also, I think this is also the second time I'm using it that it's also been recorded. So you all are seeing all of my wonderful um, possible things. Um, and I don't know if the question moved on for folks. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he's he's been all up in my email already. Um, it's very nice, um, but can be very over overwhelming um, at this day and time. So, are people able to move on to the next question? Or see the next question? Let us know. Maybe there's a Mentimeter expert in the audience. Um, I still see just the one question. Do you need to have the window still up after having answered the first one? I, oh, okay. Let's see. No. 
that we use this. Okay, next question. Here it is. Okay. Whew. Okay, mine says, please wait for the presenter to show the next slide. Are we waiting for you to show the next slide? Um, trying to figure out, let's see. Yeah, okay, there it is for me. Oh, okay. Um, I hide this in my throat because I'm like, oh my gosh, this is not working. No, it's fine. fine. And also we're having a small group in, uh, with us today. So it's good and nice and cozy. So. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, and so I'm just going to give everyone a few more minutes to just kind of like um, add their um, other stuff to it. And so as you're doing that, um, I will go ahead and um, get started. Um, let me, so you have a few minutes to think through that question and I'm just gonna start off with introducing myself. Um, and let me share my screen. So hello all. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce myself and then afterwards I will um, go back to the results and kind of go over it and then uh, dive into this. And um, after uh, 30 or 40 minutes or so, we're gonna take a break. So a little bit about me, some of my identity. So I'm a first generation American. So um, I was born and raised on the island of St. Thomas, which is a part of the US Virgin Islands, but both of my parents came from um, other islands. And so um, that is why you hear a slight accent um, in my voice. Um, but also for me, being born and raised on St. Thomas um, greatly influences um, my, um, how I carry with myself, uh, the culture and my ethnicity and things of that nature. Um, and I'm also a first generation college graduate. Um, and so I was the first in my family to go on to get my bachelor's and my master's degree. Um, my little sister, she's currently getting her um, medical degree. So she's gonna blow me out of the water. I'm really excited about that. Um, but being the first, um, as maybe several of you um, in the audience might be able to attest to, um, comes with its own trials and tribulations. Um, and so there has been a number of challenges um, and barriers. And I think um, part of that is why I'm so determined to share as much information um, as possible with folks, but also um, in regards to mentoring and, and advising uh, folks who are interested in librarianship or those who are library workers and, um, and early career librarians. Um, and I'm also Black and Afro-Caribbean. So I put Black and Afro-Caribbean because I'm racially Black, um, ethnically um, Afro-Caribbean um, due to uh, the things that I mentioned earlier. And so kind of my positionality statement, I've seen a number of different ones and this is one that um, I have thought about a lot, but you know, haven't quite put into words like I am doing today. Um, and so just acknowledging that I am a Black Afro-Caribbean cisgender woman. Um, I have over five years of experience working in academic libraries, um, post MLIS, um, you know, currently working at a historically, traditionally, and predominantly white institution, research one institution in the, in the US South, um, and that I have tenure track faculty status and rank, um, and I'm the DEI program manager, et cetera. Um, and so, I'm very conscious of talking about this because I have a level of power and privilege, but also oppression and different identities um, that I have listed here. And there's some that I haven't listed just due to the fact that um, I'm not comfortable disclosing them or due to the fact that I am, um, these are some of my invisible um, identities that um, I'm not conscious of or don't, well, not conscious of, but I don't think about um, often or does not impact me 
to a certain extent. And so um, I want you all to start thinking about what identities you all have, because this is, this is gonna be key to this conversation today, because talking about relationship building, meaning understanding ourselves first, you know, is meaning having an, uh, an, an element of emotional intelligence um, and understanding um, our own histories um, and the influences that our culture has um, and how it socialized us um, uh, throughout how we were uh, raised, um, but also right now. And I will say, um, to feel free to add questions to the chat box um, um, throughout the presentation. I've also put a link to an anonymous, anonymous well, hopefully it's an anonymous, anonymous form, so you can add questions and comments, and I'll be checking that every so often, because um, I want you all to feel comfortable to engage um, as much as you want, as much as you can. And to ask me the hard questions, to be completely honest. Let me just check the chat. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and so with that, let me stop sharing and then go to Mental Media and see what people have said. Just give me one second to... Um, wait, I'll go here and share the screen. Okay. So some things that people um, I hope to learn for today's session, no idea, um, how to be a better ally, how to build better relationships that are supportive and sensitive to others. Learn matters methods for building constructive and supportive and empathetic relationships mindfully. I am hoping I can achieve <laughs> some of these things. Um, I'm 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 over ambitious because uh, when I was communicating to Deborah about like let's let's talk about you know relationship and relationship building and what does that mean when it comes to race. Um, you know how to be better ally strategies for building relationships using a racialized lens. Um, more about your approach to relationship building. Um, and then how to do it authentically, how to learn, hope to learn more about my colleagues, specific practical tools. So I'm hoping that I touch on each one of these things um, here today, but essentially that you will leave here um, with one new thing that you didn't know before. That could just be learning a little bit more about me that you didn't know before, but hopefully um, learning more about the effort and work that goes into relationship building. Um, and that relationship building is also depending on the organizational culture that you are in. Um, and also is dependent on how people um, treat and interact with one another at your institution. So all of these are inter interrelated and interconnected. And so these are not things that you can completely separate out. Um, as I remember someone was, um, Ozzy, um, who works at Denver Public Library, there was a session she presented at and she was talking about like, you know, um, that it's hard to like, you can't separate out like the flour and the eggs after, after something has been made, you know? And so when we think about all of these, um, you know, structural, um, you know, isms and phobias that's built in, um, you can't necessarily on, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, that they're already baked in. And so one of the things that we can look at doing is how does that influence us in our own personal lives and the steps that we can do to uh, negating them or making sure that we're not perpetuating them. Um, and when I say perpetuating them, that sometimes our lack of awareness or knowledge can sometimes unintentionally um, perpetuate things or harm or to hinder even our own efforts. So even thinking about like, what does this mean when we think about um, how we engage with others, what assumptions we have, not necessarily um, of other people, but even just thinking about um, assumptions of some of the words, uh, not the words, the questions we ask people. So think about like, where do you live? That is a very intrusive question to me. Um, um, you know, usually, but that's a question that people um, typically ask, um, usually in the beginning, especially after they ask you, what do you do? 
and what is your role, you know, um, and that everything is so focused on what you produce and where you live, you know, um, and for, for others, um, they're not comfortable sharing or disclosing that information because there's, there's power that comes with um, the, whatever information they feel like they want to, they want to disclose. Um, and so with that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And then I'm going to go to my presentation. Again, I appreciate you all for adding to uh, doing the polls. Um, and I appreciate you all taking the time to be here with me and for inviting me back. Um, and I'm just going to say very, very quickly um, to ask you all, um, what are some of the things that um, you all have learned um, from the last time I had the opportunity to talk to you all? What are some of the things that you all have um, learned and um, have changed, particularly in regards to this topic? So I'll let you all think about that as I pull up my presentation. And so feel free to also add things to the to the to the Google Doc. So the question that I asked, and I'm really and I and I will tell people, and I've told people, I am really good with silences and just staring deeply into the <laughs> into the camera, um, not to intimidate anyone. Don't want that uh, to be to be the case. And I know that for some people, myself included, that depending on what question uh, questions are being asked, that I need to take um, more than a few sessions, three seconds uh, to process it. Um, but I really do feed off of audience engagement. Um, and so feel free, like I said, to add to the chat box, uh, to add to the Google document. Um, you can even message me um, privately um, in Zoom um, to provide your contact. But I'm just curious to know, because it's been, um, I think just about a year. Well, it's going to be a year, like two months from now. Um, but what have you learned um, since then? And this is not meant to make you feel shame, guilt, anything of that nature. And I also, if you want to unmute yourself, there's also that option um, to do so, or um, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you if you uh, feel comfortable, or it's much better for you to just talk aloud. Let me just bring up the chat box. All right, so talk a lot about toxic work environments and helpful um, hiring practices. Thank you. Um, anything else? Um, brought in uh, new sources. Uh, more uh, diversity, um, diverse focus resources, uh, sources, I should say, yep. Decentering whiteness, okay. So 
So thank you for that. Um, and if there's anything else that comes to your mind, feel free to add it to this document. Um, and I will say that I'm working on my laptop. And so I am trying to make sure that I, you all can see my screen um, as well as um, I can see my presenter view um, so that I make sure that I don't miss anything. So inequities and the dissemination of information from leadership. Yes, this is definitely something um, that has been, um, we found out um, at my institution too, um, in terms of, um, so at my institution, we are particularly, I would say that based on the larger UF that is faculty centric. Um, and so like we have a um, library faculty assembly, um, but there's no counterpart for staff. Well, they're looking at, they're looking at doing something um, for staff now, but before like the town hall meeting, um, how information was disseminated was up to your chair. Um, and so there are some people who are really great and really transparent and just by nature of how huge this place is, there's are some people who aren't. Um, and so you can obviously, obviously see that there is gonna be differences in um, what kind of information people get um, and who gets it and when, um, but also the, in, the ability to be able to contribute to that. And so um, how thinking about that um, influences even how people um, engage with other people or don't. So I uh, just want to acknowledge, um, do a line acknowledgement that the U of Libraries acknowledged that for thousands of years, the area now comprising the state of Florida has been and continues to be home to many Native nations. We further recognize that the main campus of the University of Florida is located on the heartland territory of two historically known Native societies, those of the Potano and of the Lachua uh, Seminole. Um, the library is acknowledged its obligation to honor the ancestral present and future native residents um, of Florida. Someone else added, as a department head decides what is important to share on their own privilege, there's a lot of paternalism. Um, yeah, and so um, depending on what your rank and status and position is, also influences how people engage with you or don't engage with you. Um, and there's also a lot of unsaid um, or unacknowledged or unresolved um, incidences and situations that also does um, impact how we decide to engage um, with one another. And if there's someone who is uh, much older in age who is um, treating someone who is younger or looks younger, as though that they are their um, child or someone um, that needs a lot of um, oversight and things of that nature, um, that, that does not come across um, well, especially when you add um, race into the situation. Great. So I just wanna take a second um, and I know that I've been like, talking very quickly, but to just breathe. Um, and I wanna acknowledge Amanda Lefwich work. Um, she is the founder of Mindful um, in LIS, um, but, and you know, talking about mindfulness and reflective practice and just taking this moment to just breathe um, and center ourselves, but also think about um, uh, what, what is it, how we're being, how we're, how we are being present. Um, and so I just wanna acknowledge uh, the work that she's done to help me become a better practitioner um, and to be um, more reflective in the work that I do, but also just taking the second to just breathe. And I'll ask you all this question. How much time do you get to think about um, and reflect on the relationship that you have and how you engage with people in your workplace? Not, not necessarily like that you carve out your time, but is there a time set aside in the workday, um, in the culture, in the, in, the, in the going ons of your institution 
that allows you to be able to engage in this work of building and cultivating relationships, but also exam examining them. So as you think about that, I just wanna acknowledge um, and have a moment of silence for those who've passed away due to uh, COVID-19, but also those who have uh, passed away known and unknown due to um, racism and uh, racial inequalities uh, in this country. So these are just some of the things that I'm hoping to go over. In addition to the things that you all have, um, you all have talked about and added saying that you wanted to kind of learn how to be a better ally, how to think about, you know, the relationships that you have, um, building it and more. So these are the, just the conversation guidelines. Um, I don't think it exists. Time to examine relationship. That said, I do plenty of internal obsessing about work relationships, um, and sometimes, and 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 one of the things is being able to say like we have the time built in to be able to focus on some of these things, um, and that it's not something that you have to build into like your work time or your break time um, that. You know, you're having these conversations, um, you're, you've been having these conversations and will continue to have these conversations, but these are conversations that are consistent, uh, you know, that they're, they're static, um, you know, people are able to um, engage in them in a multitude of ways. Um, and, um, and, and engaging with people can be very, very anxiety inducing. Like I, like I said earlier today that I was very, I'm, I am, I am nervous. It doesn't, it, it may not seem that it comes across um, like this, but I, I, I'm nervous. Cause I'm just like, I'm hoping that you all are able to, 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 to get something um, really actionable, you know, from this, but also understanding like, as you are, you're thinking and reflecting and engaging that these are actions that you are doing. You know, we can't change something. We can't um, do something that we have no clue about or that we haven't taken the time to truly understand the depth and the breadth of it. And it's also challenging what we think and what we have understood about relationships and relationship building. You know, I tell people it's like I'm a black woman. Like I have, you know, who who was who did not who who was not born and raised in this country. And so how I engage with the world and engage with different people, um, and even how I engage with other um black women is different, you know. Um, and a lot of these things, but I'm very conscious of some of the things um that um Black, Indigenous, um, Asian, Asian American, Pacific Islander, Desi, um, you know, Latinx and Hispanic folks and white folks have to do go through in this country, you know. And so I understand some of that historical and current um, history and context um, that allows me to go into these things being like, okay, so I have some some kind of baseline knowledge, but not painting everyone as the same as though that they are a monolith even within um, the people who are in attendance here, uh, I would say though, uh, maybe a handful of things we have in common, we're all human beings. Um, we all are deserving of human, basic human dignity and respect um, that we were all born and we're breathing right now. Um, but other than some of those things, we all went through puberty uh, and some, better than others, I didn't have the best of time, but you know, but we are all here, you know, but there's a lot of different things that even though I'm focusing on race, intersectionality exists. So for me, I don't just show up as just a black person. I remember there was something circulating on social media. Um, it was about in regards to a um, job, job, um, it was in regards to a job. Sorry, I, I saw it a few days ago and it was like, it ended up just being like female and diversity. 
you know, uh, that they were categorized as like female um, and diversity, you know, as though like that intersectionality doesn't exist, but also taking into account that like we, um, how people engage with us and uh, work with us um, also is dependent on what they know um, and understand what their lived experiences have been. And so, um, like I said before, I definitely want people to engage and unmute themselves if they feel comfortable doing so, add things, continue to add things to the chat box, you know, respect listening, using I statements, feeling honored and present. Um, there might be some things that I say. Um, and um, there might be some things that I say um, that maybe you disagree to. Maybe you're like, well, research says X or to the contrary. And feel free to, Feel free to, um, to say that, to add that to the chat box. Um, or even afterwards, you can contact me or add things to the, to the document because the document is gonna be open after this for people who are gonna be listening to this recording. Um, I'm assuming all of you will have good intentions since you're here um, and just staying open to this you know, reflective iterative process. Making space for those where space traditionally have not been made for and taking up space for those space traditionally has not been made for. And now this is a color-based space in regards to um, race and ethnicity. Um, anything that anyone would like to add to this, maybe some things that you all have learned through engaging the different presentations and trainings and things like that, that you would like to add to this list. Ah, so color brave space means that this is a space wanting this to be a space where people of color, BIPOC folks, Black Indigenous people of color can feel comfortable uh, speaking up and engaging in. No problem. And I will say, do not suffer in silence. I am here. Ask me the hard questions. Ask me the easy questions. Ask me just ask me questions. Um, I don't want it to seem like this is a stage and a stage type thing because there's things that I'm always constantly um, learning, um, especially through um, conversation, conversating, conversing, um, engaging um, with others. Okay, these are the brave space agreements. Um, I especially love these and so grateful that Mackenzie Mack that they created them. And this was expired by Mickey Scott B. Jones, uh, that we agree to struggle against racism, sizes, and transphobia, classism, sexism, ableism, ageism, rankism. Those are two new things that I added to this. And the ways we internalize myths and misinformations about our own identities and identities of other people at firms since birth that that has happened and that is still happening. And the session and many others that you attended and will attend is to make sure that we, um, do not continue to do that and to correct um, and to get the facts and to get information from, from people with those identities. No space can be completely safe and we agree to work together to its harm reduction, centering those most affected by injustice in the room, even if it means centering ourselves. At times, um, with those who have underrepresented, marginalized, uh, minoritized or oppressed identities, um, that we are not centered. And so, uh, this means um, centering yourself right now. Um, whether you're currently here listening to this recording, uh, that we agree to center those most impacted by injustice um, in this space, in other spaces. We agree to sit with the discomfort that comes with having conversations about race, gender, identity, the nonprofit industrial complex, et cetera. I could replace a nonprofit industrial complex with librarianship. <laughs> um, we agree to uh, try our best not to shame ourselves from the vulnerability that these kind of conversations require. Um, and I will post to people, um, how, what is your, what are some of the things um, and emotions and feelings that you have experienced um, over the last year um, in regards to um, 
the pandemic, but especially in regards to the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and many others since then. What are some of the emotions have you felt uh, and dealt with um, in regards to race, oppression, um, hatred? We agree to value the viewpoints of other people that do not challenge or conflict with our right to exist or challenge or conflict with another's right to exist. So understanding, for me, I've had conversations with people about the fact that if there's someone who really is anti, um, is promoting anti-Blackness, um, that um, me working with them is engaging in psychological and emotional violence, you know, and that, um, we should not be able to have people who are dealing with systems and structures that set up to oppress them and continue to be forced to engage with others who see them as less than or don't see them as human beings. Sometimes the, the, the root cause of these conversations is not about fairness or respect to me in certain cases. It's more about seeing people as human beings where they have human dignity and respect knowing that we have people who love and appreciate and um, want us to be um, the way that we are without thinking that one race or group or identity is superior to another. We agree that it's okay to have feelings. Yes, we are human beings. We have feelings, we feel even during work. I feel like there are some times where there's that assumption that we have to put our emotions and feelings away in a box and that we cannot engage in the way that we, we want to engage, that we have to, we engage in our own tone policing or people police how our own tones and how we show up. And that for me, there's been times that I can't cry. I can't, that I can't show um, negative emotions without people feeling threatened um, or people feeling, um, that I'm too aggressive or that I'm too much. Um, it's okay to feel uncomfortable when we're discussing complex topics about boundaries, accountability, personal relationships, organizational relationship, justice, and care. So if you agree to this, uh, feel free to add I agree into the chat box for those of you who are here live. Thank you. And so also we'd like to employ progressive stacking. Um, I think most people are familiar with it at this point, but um, for any questions or comments for those who identify as BIPOC or from underrepresented groups, you just add the asterisk um, at the start of your question and comment and it will be prioritized. So um, if there's anything I'm missing from this list, uh, feel free to add to the chat box. Um, so different isms that we are currently dealing with. So racism, sexism, classism, sizeism, ableism, ethnocentrism, anti-Semitism, ageism, and colorism. Um, homophobia, Islamophobia, xenophobia, transphobia, anti-indigeneity, and misogyny. Is there anything here that I may need to clarify or dive a little bit more into? Okay, everyone is well aware um, and knowledgeable about these things, all right? So race as a social construct. So as we understand, and as you probably have read tons and listened to many people, I'm not gonna dive into this um, too much, but just talk about what this means um, for me. So for me, I was not conscious about race, um, you know, being considered black um, until I came to this country, until I came to this main, to the mainland. Um, I'm saying this country like I'm from another country. Um, when I came to the mainland, um, you know, for me, where where I was born and raised, um, it wasn't necessarily like racism was built into the structure. Yes, but the more we had to deal with was more of colorism. 
So basically the concept of the, the lighter, the wider, the better. And the fact that like the closer to whiteness you were, where you looked, the more power that you had and the more desirable you were. Um, and so even though race is a social construct, um, race has impacted my life tremend tremendously, even if I wasn't conscious of it. Um, when I was in elementary or middle school or high school, um, I think for me, coming to this country, the mainland, um, has meant, um, you know, dealing with what does it mean to be Black um, in America um, and dealing with the history that comes with it for those who are foundational Black Americans. Um, and I'm not going to speak for um, other groups and identities, um, other racial um, groups, but think about when was the first time you knew, or you realized that you were white or black or Asian or Latinx or Native American? Feel free to add in the chat box. When was the first time? What age? And my apologies if, if, if this, I'm unintentionally re-traumatizing you, but just really thinking about it. Like when did you realize about your race? Some people, preschool, first grade, elementary school at some point, okay? Always, you know, for some people they never, it was just a part of it from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Elementary school. Preschool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so for some folks, this was just, they were having conversations about race early, understanding that they were different, that they were other and othered, you know, um, that especially for folks who are uh, looking at the, the chat box, you know, if you're multiracial or biracial, you know, and you're, you're growing up in that, um, that home, you know, that you, you see it, you know, um, and really understanding for some people, they could never, they were never innocent or ignorant or unaware of, of race and understanding that not only um, are they of a different race, but understanding that some people are not supportive of those outside of their race, you know? And so when you first realize um, that, you know, what age, what happened afterwards? How did that impact you going forward? Yeah. And that's the thing is that race is race and ethnicity um, is different outside of the United States. Um, you know, we've been socialized um, to whiteness as, as the baseline as normal, as the benchmark, you know, uh, that racism is endemic, that it's normalized as a part of everything. You know, um, it's the water that we swim in that we don't see um, and don't acknowledge at times, um, or some people don't acknowledge at times. And so racial equality and same thing that there's probably a number of different definitions, same, different. Um, for me, racial equality, equity, not equality, equity um, is understanding for me, equity comes from a place of knowing um, what each person needs and understanding what goes based on the different races, what goes for one is not gonna go for the same. 
is understanding that there is a lot of structural issues, but even thinking about how we engage with people interpersonally and the structures within that that impacts it. So in your instance, so you um, in a UNC Greensboro, uh, from what I know and understand, that this is an institution, um, if I remember my geography clearly, uh, that can be constituted in the South. Feel free to correct me. I do not have a firm grasp of US geography. Um, and I should know, because I think I've been there before. Um, Okay, South for certain. Okay, great. Um, and thinking about um, the histories that comes with um, that comes with being from the South, but also um, I would say is Greensboro uh, what is the predominant race um, and ethnicity of Greensboro? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those who are different, um, especially those who are visibly different are treated differently. Um, but um, to my question, I'm, one, I'm, curious, I'm curious to know, for those of you, what is the racial and ethnic makeup of Greensboro? I mean, this is a Googleable question, um, but I'm curious to know like, if, if, if people know this in terms of like what the racial and ethnic makeup is of Greensboro. Okay, so predominantly white um, with uh, black, then Asian, and then, okay, two more races, some other race and two more races. That was interesting how these categories are broken out. Um, I think about this. Do you think that um, the support services, the, um, the support services, the um, cultural areas, um, even um, access to um, social services are um, racially racially equitable for Greensboro, North Carolina. So thinking about like where you live uh, within the city, thinking about what you've experienced would you say that based on the geographic, based on the information provided, that um, there is enough support services and resources um, for the different racial and ethnic groups? Okay, so a lot of people are saying no, um, that Greensboro has been pretty segregated racially um, and that, See. Don't think the super service is, is equitable. Okay. And so what do you think that that means for the University of uh, North Carolina Greensboro? Right? So, so you have a city, you have a county, you have this place where at the baseline for the people living there it's not equitable, especially when it comes to race. Do we think that the university would be any different? Do you think people who come from that community who end up attending University of Greensboro or even people who come out, who come from out of state or out of the county would think that UNCG provide resources that um, that how they provide resources is equitable. I think we can be seen as an inroach in an all white force, especially as we have in, ex expanded into traditionally African American neighborhoods. And that is a trend across America. This is something that's happening here, but it has happened here as UF has expanded and the gentrification that is still ongoing in a lot of communities and not um, African American, but other racial and ethnic communities um, as well. And so I would posit this question to you all, what does this then mean for the library and the library resources? What does this then mean for um, 
our policies and procedures internally for ourselves. What does this mean when we are able to know that um, someone, that a, a policy was bent for someone um, just due to the fact that they were of the same race and they were white? Yeah, I don't think I need to define inclusion. I think you all know what inclusion is at this point. Um, for me, um, inclusion is not the table analogy because I absolutely hate the table analogy. It's being able to show how you want to show when you want to show up and knowing that your voice is going to be heard. And understanding that if you do not want to be heard, that's totally fine. Like if you do not want to show up, it's totally fine. But you do have the option and the choice to be your authentic self and you do not have to to, de to engage in deauthentication, um, as the research done by Katrina Davis Kendrick um, in that regards. Um, this green thread doesn't under racial barriers to certain neighborhoods. Green lining, um, not green lining, red lining. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna break right here. Um, well, let me just see what is on the next slide. Actually, no, a lie, not gonna break. I'm gonna actually put this into the chat box, hold on. Um, let me stop sharing the screen. And this is an activity that I want you all to do and then we can we can go on break. Um, I'll have you all, I'll start you all off and so then you all can go um, on a break. Let me just stop presenting this link into the chat box. Let me just explain this and then we can go into break and then we're gonna come back. If everyone is okay with that. Okay. I can't believe we've been talking uh, for almost an hour. Oh gosh. All right, so the point of this and the link should still work. Um, so this is a privilege and identity wheel. Um, so, um, Nicola. So uh, Sunny Kim and um, Nikki Andrews 2017, they created this and this is a privilege and identity wheel um, that I just want you all to take a few minutes um, uh, to, to fill out uh, during this break. We're going to come back at two o'clock, um, but essentially you are going to um, you can write it down in your, in your notebook, but just make a note um, wherever you feel comfortable. But um, writing down, um, essentially thinking about your identity and writing down um, or placing it um, closer to the middle of the wheel if it has, um, if it has um, more privilege and then it is um, closer to the, um, outer end of the wheel if it has less, less privilege. So you get to decide based on identity um, you've identified. And so community support, that's usually a question that people have is, is that if they are culturally validating um, places in the community that you're able to go to. So think about community stores, places of worship, um, you know, thinking about um, things of that nature. So, um, we're gonna come back in five minutes. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box, um, but I will see you all in five minutes. Welcome back. Um, thank you all joining me with a uh, second hour. Um, I know that this can be uh, kind of long, but uh, this next section is going to um, be more engaging um, and um, allow for you to um, contribute a bit more. And so with that, I'm gonna go back to um, the activity. Let me pull up my screen. Present. Okay. 
So I'm curious to know, I'm gonna ask you all this question and I should have asked you all this before you went on a break. Um, what are your three most salient identities? So these are the identities that you hold um, cherish to you, that's important to you, that's that's critical to how you see yourself navigate the world. What are those three identities out of the ones that's listed here? And there's probably some identities that aren't even here. Um, and you could have felt feel free to like add it to add it to the wheel, the wheel. Um, but and feel free to add to the chat box um, or to unmute yourself. Um, I'm looking for some volunteers. Um, what are some three? So sexuality, community to support, age, race, sexuality, and class, physical ability, gender, mental health. Yep. Um, and so these these are some of the and it's hard, isn't it? It really is, and that's why I ask people to pick um, just three. You know. Um, but it allows you to think about which ones are the ones that are important to you, you know, because what, what we, what we see as critical to ourselves is not necessarily what the world sees or the world accepts or the world wants or the world celebrates, you know, and so, you know, we are, uh, physical ability, education, gender, race, sexuality, neurodivergence, um, and so, and some of these things are, um, what, what can be considered um, invisible identities. So, you know, unless you disclose it to someone, they're not necessarily going to know. So like your education, um, I, it's very hard for me to look at someone and be like, ah, oh, yes, they have a PhD. You know, they have a high school diploma, you know. Um, you know, the same thing for sexuality, like, yes, there are some markers and behaviors and norms and like, um, um, ways of mannerisms and ways, ways of carrying yourself um, and dressing um, as well. But um, for the most part, if someone, you know, says that they are bisexual, you know, um, it's not like there is a, you can be like, oh, bisexuals only look like this or only act this way. Um, and so as you think about um, this and just even just seeing from from other people who are sharing this, you know, um, that these are some of the things that are might be different than what it is that the world, uh, how we engage with the world. And so I will pose this question to you all. What are the top three, it could be two, it could be one identities um, that impact you the most as you navigate this world? So the first question I'd ask was, which one of the identities, uh, three identities is most important to you? But this question is which one or three um, identities listed here that impact you the most, that you are forced to think about the most or consider the most as you navigate this world. And it's totally fine. Sometimes I have to like re rethink how I ask, ask the questions. But the first one was just more of like, what, what, is, what, what do you connect with? What is important to you? And the second one is what do the world essentially deem that you should think about, force you to think about, like you have to navigate that, you know, this is something that, that changes how you even like drive or um, how you, you know, uh, what day or night time of the night that you go out running. Let me just make sure that what people are saying, the race, gender, class. Yep. Um, and so for me, race is the thing, gender um, as well. And I would say, um language um just a bit because i i've had a lot of people who have um when i open my mouth and especially when my accent is thick um you know people always ask me where i'm from and so it, it gets the sense that like i'm not from the mainland um but also 
um, that I have to be conscious. Um, I'm not multilingual or bilingual. Um, I guess how I talk would be considered American Creole when I'm not code switching. Uh, but I have to be very conscious of, of how I pronounce things. So I come across as um, sounding educated um, and knowledgeable. And so um, for this question, is there anything else that anyone else wants to um, add in regards to which of these identities impact you the most? And so I will say, how often have you thought about your identities in this way? How much time have you given this? Or it has been given in your in 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 your um in your workplace, not just in your personal life, because some people have had to think about these things every single day, as someone pointed out. But in your workplace, in regards to like how often do you uh, think about your identities? I would say in the workplace, and have these conversations in the workplace. You know, even thinking about. Um, you know, one of the things I think about is, is supervision, you know, um, and thinking about like, you know, how you supervise a black woman, it's going to be different than how you supervise a white male or a black female, you know, when you're engaging with someone, um, you know, taking into consideration that there's a lot that you don't know about that person. Um, and so for me, I'm coming at it from a way of um, cultural humility, being other oriented, you know, acknowledging the fact that I don't know everything that there is to know about that person and their identities and the cultures that their identities um, are, are comprised of. Um, but knowing that, you know, they have a level of knowledge and capabilities um, and they have the capacity to engage. And so for a lot of people, they might be thinking about their race a lot and other people aren't. And so that, that speaks to people's ability to engage in this conversation in a, in a way and a level that others uh, might be still struggling with or, start, or starting to engage with in, in, in this way. Oops, go back. Well, actually, no, this is what I wanted to to go to next. And so kind of what um, kind of sparked a lot of this and even thinking about last summer and thinking about what, we, what we're what we doing now, um, when we think about the relationships that we have in the workplace, how many of them are people outside of our race and ethnicity that we have? You know, like if you want to, if you want to quantify it and say, I have, you know, usually I tell people be, don't be like, oh, I have a black friend and that's why I'm not this. But just thinking about the people we have in our circles who we call, who we think of near and dear to us. So, you know, as we think about our own identities and identities that we have, but even thinking about when it comes to race and ethnicity, thinking about like around us, how many people do we have that is of another race? or ethnicity and thinking about how that came to be. Was that due to the relationships of that your, your parents and your family members and other people have? Um, was that something that you sought out? Is that something that you, um, that was just based on, you know, elementary, high school, middle school, undergrad, graduate school? How many people, if you had to right now we'll kind of ask me to do right now how many people outside of the race and ethnicity that you have how many people do you have that's outside of your race and ethnicity so for me it would be how many people who i know are asian asian american pacific islander who are white who are um latinx who are native american um and I will say that for me, I didn't really have a white friend until I went to graduate school. You know? And so when we think about, and this, this means work and, well, 
let me just say personal life first. But if you're calculating work and personal life, but like in your personal life, and think about like, why is the fact that you may have an abundance or maybe not many? Have you put yourself in situations that have allowed you to engage with people from another race and ethnicity? Or have you stepped back? Has there been spaces where an opportunities where you have either created them yourself or other people have created and you've stepped into them or not? You know, let's think about how we spend our time and who we allow into our circles, whether that is our personal uh, circles, but also like our work circles, people who are our support systems. You know, for me, I did not kind of like set out and it's not being like, I'm just gonna collect, collect one person from each race and ethnicity. Like this is, this is not, this is not like Barbie dolls. You know, um, you're not collecting <laughs> one person to say like, I have, you know, X, Y, Z. That's, this is not what I'm telling you to do. <laughs> yes, we're not catching them out. This is not Pokemon, uh, <laughs> you know? And so really thinking about like, um, the kind of, the kind of re the, the friendships that we have, the relationships that we have, you know, with people, you know, and how we go about doing that and for being a lot more strategic um, about that, you know, but also being a lot more intentional too, you know? Um, and I will say like making friends, developing, you know, mutually beneficial working relationships is a hard thing as an adult you know um i will not lie it is a hard thing um and sometimes our institution does not socialize us or support that socialization in such a way that allows us to be able to develop and diversify you know um oh, i need the word diversify at this point being able to like um work and engage with others so um, yeah, I would say my, my virtual community is also a lot more um, racially diverse as well. So, and, but then the reason I pulled this up and connecting it all, all together um, is that libraries do not operate outside of society. We are do not, as soon as you come into work or turn on your Zoom or do whatever the case is, that all of a sudden all your identities fade away into the darkness and we are just all you know together and we're all the same you know uh, when i think about librarianship i didn't know how white it was when i decided to become a librarian in middle school and the first ala conference that i attended in 2014 in uh, las vegas um i believe it was a spectrum leadership institute that allowed me to attend i was very overwhelming for me um and um ever since then i've been just kind of thinking about um how is it that as as library workers that we might be perpetuating um and supporting these systems and structures um and that library has a long history of supporting racism and oppression um in libraries and just because of someone can't remember who said this it's, this was in social media uh, i think either twitter or facebook that just because you work in a library uh doesn't automatically make you a social justice warrior or an activist it doesn't make you you know that you are all down for or that you're a radical and that you've been supporting um equity diversity and inclusion from the beginning Let me stop sharing. And now I am going to ask you all um, some questions. Right now, well, more questions, not that I have not been asking you all um, enough questions um, already. So when it comes to building relationships, how much time do you put into it? I mean, I know I'm, I've never really pondered it 
as much until I was starting to to think about this presentation and, and developing it. And when I when I met with uh, Deborah a few months ago, um, in really thinking about like we had talked about like the science of you know relationship building, um, but I was like, for me, I'm coming at it from the sense of like what I have done to build relationship, what I've seen other people do. I'm not going to spit a whole lot of data well, data or statistics or anything of that nature at you. Like we all know how to find things. Um, you know, we all know how to back things up and, and I will um, attribute things as, um, and give credit um, to things that I, that's not me, um, and that I um, bring up. But thinking about how much time do we spend in terms of like cultivating, building relationships, you know? And so someone says less time as they get older, depends on how busy I am. And that's a key thing, busyness, productivity, our workloads. How many people are overworked right now that you have more work than you can reasonably get done in 40, 45, 50, 55, 60 hours a week? So when you're overwhelmed and you're, and you're, and you're stressed out or you're burnt out, uh, that does not leave you a lot of conscious time or even energy or capacity to either maintain the relationship you have or create new ones or think about, is this a relationship that I should be sustaining? Is this somebody that I should be giving my time and attention to? How much effort and resources am I putting into this? You know, what am I getting out of it? Is this a relationship that is uniquely built and created for just the two of us, or if it's a group of people. Let's just go through the chat box. Um, don't put a lot of time into building new relationships. Mine are created due to proximity. People I already see or interact with, I spend a fair amount of time maintaining relationships. And sometimes that's just the case of it. Like I, I'm closer to the people in my workplace and build relationship with the people that I work with closely due to just like the relevancy of our positions. But there's other people that I have intentionally sought out um, or maybe I met in a committee or a, I might have worked with them tangentially in some project, but I was like, oh, this is a cool person. Or I think some of our things are, are um, in alignment. And sometimes there's people we meet um, previously that, you know, we are able to engage with due to just the nature of our job or position. But in the workplace, question, and you all may have an answer, may, or maybe not, how much time is allotted or created to get to know different people? How many outside of your units? So this is outside of like your unit department. Because you know, some units and departments might have like, you know, little parties or get togethers or different stuff like that, even virtually or like a, like a happy hour. But how many library wide, you know, uh, things that is not tied to the holidays um, or anniversaries is there? Is that a part of the onboarding and orientation? You know, are there, um, affinity groups that exist. And the reason I'm, 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 I'm posing these as, 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 as questions and things that I've thought about was that for me, um, I tell people this and I do not care. I know that I connect better with people when I know that they're from the Caribbean because there's that sense of familiarity. Um, especially um, when I'm meeting them on the mainland and, and, and I happen to work closely with them because there's this just shared um, lived experiences that does not mean, I mean that I do not have to explain a lot of things to them. And for me, it's like, it doesn't matter which island they come from. Um, it doesn't matter if they're like second or third generation, you know, for me. Um, but I do put the time and the effort in asking people questions, but even being conscious that for some people, they don't have the bandwidth, they don't have the time, but they've been burned and they don't trust easily and they've been betrayed by others. I'm just gonna go through the chat box real quick. Um, in the reading group, 
in a lot of ways, I think don't spend time articulating to themselves, not the or the but parse out the different ways of putting in a methodical name, but methodical way of putting a name to it. Um, so the fact that like you have to put the the time and the effort, but in a way that um for you to figure out like who is it that I might need or might want, but also forgetting my train of thought because I was like, I'm just reading it and I was like, oh, this is good. Um, it's gonna come back to me, I'm hoping. Um, yeah, have some social events, but those are pretty limited. Doing it intentionally somehow seems more to some that is artificial or even manipulative though. A relationship that has grown up with the ground untouched by human hands. We spend a lot of time thinking about how to approach development team romantic, but for some reason, other types like workplace or coalition building. Yeah, there. Yep, totally agree with you, Deborah. Um, that it just seems um, that it is serendipitous that we have to leave it to chance. We have to leave it to fate. Um, you know, we we just have to like you know hear that one thing that's going to be like, oh, this person you know, um, I want to get to know this person. And so like, you know, um, to your point, like there's like these different love languages that exist, you know, and, um, you know, there's different ways of like, um, there's, there's probably different relationship models, but there's also, um, what was it I was gonna say? Not supervisory, um, not supervisory styles. Um, it's, gonna, it's gonna come back to me. I know it, but really even thinking about like when we say we're building workplace relationships, understanding what we want from a relationship and what the boundaries are in that regard. More got together before COVID, my relationship with activities, now that they're at least feeling by the white side. Relationship maintenance takes work. Um, I spend maybe I would say upwards of 10 hours a week when I think about um, the time that I spend cultivating um, and maintaining the relationships that I have. So these are um, my work relationships. These are people who like either we have like weekly um, lunches um, or monthly meetups um, with different groups. Like I've done a lot of community, developing communities of practice um, in my particular position. I'm like, this is something that is key to the work that I'm doing because some of the work that I do is very sensitive and I can't, um, I need to be able to trust and understand the person that I'm working with in order to work on some of these projects and do some of this work. Um, and so when we think about it, um, it's putting in that time. Um, and if we don't have, um, and being able to communicate that and being able to communicate over boundaries. That's very times in all honesty, I go to great lengths to keep coworkers in the work life box. I'm careful about blurring those lines. And that's totally fine. You have boundaries. Boundaries are so key, critical, and important. And I will keep saying that I'm I'm working on my boundary work um, right now. And for some people, is that like they're not going to do that five o'clock or six o'clock or seven o'clock or eight o'clock happy hour. Um, they're not going to meet up for lunch in the weekends. They're not going to, you know, um, meet up during their lunch, um, their lunch time. And we have to respect that. We have to respect that, and we have to honor that. And we don't. We we do not need to be expecting people to um, adhere, um, especially if they um, are really and truly just want to be able to be like I want to work with you you're a great human being i uh, you know we can be colleagues and that's it you know um we have a good working relationship and that's to the extent that that's what i want balance um people don't have a lot of models for relationships and fully fledged friendships i i will say this and i will say this again you do not need to be someone's friend to have a healthy working relationship. I will say this again, for those, in, for those in the back of the room that did not hate me. You do not need to be friends with someone in order to be in a healthy working relationship. So um, 
sometimes we think that we need to be friends with our colleagues in order to work together or to get work done. Um, we don't. We need to be, we need to respect one another. Um, we need to be civil, even sometimes that could be quoted for something else, but we do not need to be, um, I do not need to confine in you all that I am um, in order for us to work together. Um, we do not need to be bosom buddies in order to, um, to have a healthy working relationship. Um, and to Deborah's point, like close friendships, being friendly equals being allies, being in solidarity, being coalition. And so there are some people in the workplace that you will never be um, allies uh, or, you know, be a part of a coalition with or in solidarity with. And that's, and that's fine. Like you cannot have, there's going to be multiple people who have multiple titles and positions. Oh, well, there's a lot of messages that's popping up. Sorry. I'm like going through these really slowly. So now they used to be because I've been burned by... You want us to unmute Antoine and just like talk? For yes, some... definitely, definitely. Um, especially so I can like scroll down to the bottom. So I'm like, a lot of people are saying things and I'm like, oh, okay. So many people are... If you need help with that, yeah. So um, yeah, I think um, Jenny made um, a great um, comment about looking for more communities um, that are like hers with, you know, that can understand her, her challenges with disability. And um, a couple of us were talking to her about like, yeah, it's, it's really important to be able to find affinity groups um, that, you know, get your, your, get you without having to explain, like Melody and I have often commented to each other how this is the first time for either of us that we've um, worked with another half Korean who also shares many other like life experiences and identities and like we're both early career and have a lot of the same anxieties and experiences with being like and you know child of an immigrant of being an immigrant like I was born in Korea um like being that person to like like being an eight-year-old translating on the phone because your mom doesn't understand the English well enough to so like say like all of these like little bitty things that like we just get it we we just like we don't have to explain it all and it's our first time working with someone um, who shares all of those things in the workplace. And it has been really incredible for both of us um, to, to have that. I didn't realize, I didn't know I wanted that, uh, but now that I've had it, I'm really gonna miss it <laughs> when I'm gone. Um, but yeah, it's so important. And then Shonda also um, was saying that, um, I believe strongly that moving up the friendship hierarchy is our own privilege, simply working together is not the beginning of a friendship um, and lots of plus ones to that. Um, definitely something that has to be earned. Yes. Um, and the thing is that we, we, we have to be, sometimes we have to look at this through, um, some people are sin, sin, like um, trauma informed, but like a healing informed lens to this work too, to understand like for some people, as someone said that they've been burned before in regards to, in regards to this. And, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be at UNCG, it could have been in a previous institution or previous institutions. You know, so like when we move to an institution, we don't, not, we don't necessarily leave behind what the good and the bad um, and the ugly. Um, so that, that travels with us. And so, so there's some people who may be, um, who, may, who may have really, really high walls and um, may be really unapproachable due to a number of different factors. And it's not for us to just um, write them off um, and just continue to write them off because they don't engage in the way that you want them to engage in, or they don't do the things you assume that they, they should be doing. You know, um, for me, a lot of things are contextual. Like I want people to forgive me when I'm mean mugging in a meeting because I just have to deal with, you know, another black person losing their life. Like I don't have the capacity to um, smile and or be stoic or pretend everything is okay um, in the world. You know, when people have their own um, personal issues and circumstances and, and challenges that that does influence how they approach um, you know, the workplace. But another thing that I would say when we think about these relationships um, and thinking about like forming partnerships with people and uh, thinking about the communities and coalition building um, 
is that people, it's also not just with the people and things that we do, it's also what we don't say and what we don't do as well that plays a role in all of this work, you know? And so when we're thinking about like how you engage or don't engage with someone in your, even in your circle, even in your relationship, I'm thinking about the times when you thought someone would speak up, but they didn't, you know, excuse me, or that someone has decided that they, um, that your suffering and, and, and pain was not something um, worthy to be considered or to be acknowledged, you know? Um, and that, that does impact things. And, as more, and, and sometimes relationships do shift and they change. So what your relationship might be with, with someone in the beginning might change a year or two years in. And also as you learn more information about them. I don't know about you all, but I don't, I don't, I don't not give everything out um, in the first month, two months. Sometimes for me, it takes a year for me to really and truly get to know somebody. And when somebody says, be authentic, I usually question when somebody tells me to be authentic. Um, but when we talk about authenticity and having authentic relationships, understanding that for some people, their authentic self, their full self will never be accepted or wanted. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, there are some people, um, I grew up in St. Thomas, and so um, this phrase is, is, I heard a lot in St. Thomas, and I don't know if it's like other places, but essentially sometimes your, your soul just takes to that person, your spirit just takes to them. You know, you, you have no clue why, you know, it just, it, just, it just feels like, you know, you are just connected, you know, on another level, you know? And so those, there are some relationships uh, that happens through work. But there's also some things that we have to think about and consider. So when you are um, uh, meeting someone for the first time, uh, what are some of the first questions you ask that person? So it could be, you know, at a social event at work. It could be, you know, when you are meeting the person for a project or on a committee, um, whatever circumstance. But the, when you're the first time when you meet somebody, you know, what are usually the first questions you ask them? So, hey, how are you doing? No, thank you for, for, for putting that, um, that being the first question. Now, <laughs> I think Deborah knows where this is going. Um, so if somebody respond that, um, how are they, how are they doing? Do you really listen to that, to their response? When they say, you know, maybe today has been a really tough um, and challenging day. I just had to deal with someone who said that all lives matter to me. You know, when, when we say, how are you doing? Do we stop and do we really listen and want to hear from that other person? Or is that just some um words to be like oh this is this is this is an expectation as we navigate not navigate as we engage with one another you know and so someone says like you know automatic and i did the same thing um you know when when i would start and when i told people honestly you know, they will look at me some kind of way, like, what is she, I'm not her therapist, like, what is she, why is she, <laughs> you know, um, but really thinking about, like, when we ask these questions, um, that sometimes we may not get the response that we want, because some people might really think that you genuinely, genuinely want to know, how are they, you know, and so for me, it's like, unless I, I can fully 
accept the answer that somebody's going to give. I try not to ask them that question. Or if I ask that, you know, um, just being like, you do not have to disclose anything you don't feel comfortable disclosing. Um, or it just be like, you know what, it is incredibly tough. I am here. Usually when some people, when people ask me that question now, I'm like, I am here. And it's up for them to interpret that and ask me for more information. Or I just, or the conversation just moves along. Um, Yep. Just hanging in there. Um, but also thinking about like some of these questions that we ask, sometimes it feels like we're entitled to know more about that person and what they're doing than they're willing to disclose and share. You know? So if somebody says like, I don't feel like answering you right now, how would you respond? I'm not doing fine. How are you? Um, so thank you, Sarah. Um, now, how long have you been at UNCG? Where are you from? Um, so that question, um, where are you from? I try to get rid of that from my vocabulary, from, from, from asking um, people that question. So when we ask that question, what are we trying to what are we trying to learn about that person? So when you ask that question, whoever has ever asked that question in the past or still currently asked that question, what do you what do you what are you asking or hoping to get from? Because when people ask me that question, I'm like, are you asking me where I was born and raised? Are you asking me where I'm living? Are you asking me um, you, what, what specifically are you? what country, what nationality I have, what my experience, like what exactly are you asking when you ask that question? And what, how can that be read from people from different places? And, you know, Deborah had asked, like, do you ask BIPOC folks that question? So when people ask me that question, I'm like, what are you trying to, I'm like, what do you hope to get from this? And the reason I'm asking you what questions you ask feel like we're kind of getting a little bit meta, um, is that some of these questions can be an automatic turn off for some folks from the get-go. Um, because some of these questions can be, can be triggering for folks. Um, and some of these questions can be considered invasive, um, uh, sorry, intrusive, but also some of these questions um, may not be getting at the answers that we think we want. Yeah, so um, I agree with you, Melody, in terms of just like um, asking them, like, tell me what you're interested in. Um, what gets you jazzed up? What, what brings you joy? You know, I'm not asking somebody where you where you located, because I'm like, why do you need to know that information? Like, are you going to be popping up by me? Um, <laughs> for any for any reason, um, like you don't know that person might have had to do with a stalker in a past situation, you know, or or something of that nature. And not to make it all like doom and gloom, but to be a little bit more conscious about the kind of questions we ask and the responses that we get from people. Um. Yeah. Um. And a lot of people, and so it's like you know, that, that perpetual foreigner myth, but it's also just connecting, well, it's also um, being like, oh, you're from someplace else of the US. Oh, if you're from this place, oh, you have less power, less privilege, you know? Um, so sometimes when you ask where I'm from and depending on the response, I know, and I've seen people change when I tell them. You know, people change, you you do change. Like, you know, you may not be conscious of it, but when someone does response, you do change. When you think about that. When you, when you respond, when, when they respond to you. Oh. 
Yep. What romantic romance novels are you reading nowadays? I'm like, what fan fiction are you reading? What gets, what gets you jabs up? <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. Where you really from? No. Where you real? No. Like where you? Where your parents from? Where your great grandparents from? No. Where your great great? You just kind of like, what do you? Oh, you're you're trying to make it seem like I'm not American right that i'm not from here that i i'm not i'm not deserving of your respect or your time or your attention or your energy or your resources going forward yeah so when we think about some of these things understanding that like a lot of this impacts us and others Exactly. And, 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 look, oh, sorry. Totally agree with you, Jackson. Um, and, um, and for people to understand, like, some of these questions really does not have anything to do um, with the situation at hand or really getting to know someone. Because if you know somebody lives on the northwest side of town, is that saying that this person has money and they're well to do? You know, if they live in a if they live in a house as opposed to an apartment complex, um, you know, thinking about what these questions, these responses say. Where are you from? Can seem that it can impact people. I'm just saying, do not answer, don't ask that question. My suggestion, recommendation going forward, that you don't ask that question. If you want to be like, where do you live? You know, are you, are you, are you, are you, uh, did you just move to North Carolina? Did you just move to the area? Um, you know, you know, there's a lot of different ways we can think about restructuring. Um, the questions that we ask of folks, okay. I see that there's 17 minutes left and I just wanna just go through, go through my outline. Um, so what does it mean to have um, a racialized lens or look at things through a racial lens? Um, part of it is looking at um, how will this impact this racial group? Looking at, from there's been a, this large movement towards anti-racism and um, I, I don't care anymore. Um, I'm I'm anti anti racism. Not to say I'm for racism, because it sounds like it. Okay, I am not. Just this, this is to be very very clear for those who are listening now, those who are listening to the recording. I am not for racism. Um, we have jumped. Won't well, we? I think that there is a lot of attention that has been put into anti racism, without understanding what. Um, the impact, fully understanding the impact of race and racism, um, but also and for us to understand that, like, for me, anti-racism is looking at things through a racialized lens, is thinking about, like, who are we continually to privilege and preference and normalize and support and give attention and care to, and who are we not? Okay is for us to understand that like our, um, when we think about these resources and we think about um, the way that we even talk and engage with one another, who is that privileging and practicing? You know, um, when we think about, um, and so for me, um, looking at things through a racialized lens, racialized lens is saying like for tenure promotion or the promotion process, um or you know the evaluation process do we unduly evaluate those who are black harsher than we do our asian or our white or a native american or a latinx counterpart do we do we assess and look at that in that way do our black colleagues have more uh or written up more frequently 
or people go around to their supervisor saying that so-and-so did not say good morning to me today. Do we look at how we um, award professional development? Do we look at the fact that we may avoid working with our Black colleagues more than anyone else, or our Asian colleagues, or Native American, or Latinx? I think something that you mentioned earlier that um, I talked about a little bit in the chat as well um, is really ringing true to me, um, Tawana, when you were saying, you know, that we need to have a trauma informed lens when approaching new relationships. And um, that's really ringing true to me. Um, I think it's a conversation that I had recently with a friend um, about um, like, mm, sort of like the, the presumptions. It's, I, I think there's a parallel here to a lot of the presumptions that get made about like what default states are or should be um, with whiteness. Mm. Um, but I think a lot of people, in particular white people who have not really had to think about this, assume that like workplace relationships start at a default of like a net zero, you know, like I don't know them, they don't know me, you know, we like I haven't done anything to offend them, like, you know, we're starting from nothing. Um, and so, you know, well, I haven't I haven't done anything. Why are they behaving this way? Why are they not being like super friendly? Why aren't they being open? Why aren't they? turning on the camera, sharing, you know, in, in work meetings. Um, and this, this is going to, um, for, um, um, this, this is going to sound like maybe to, to, uh, people who, that I've talked to about this recently, like it's coming straight from that specific conversation, but I promise it's not because it's one that I've had many times, uh, with many people, um, like things like that specifically because in, sorry, I'm having a hard time articulating this. And it was something that in having those conversations, I realized that I think many white folks or white people who don't come from some marginalized identities, because I think queer people and lots of others, uh, people who have to who feel like they need to hide aspects of their um, of identity, like particularly people with disabilities who feel maybe that they um, can't be open about it um, and talk about why they're having you know trouble or missing meetings and stuff like that, because it'll cause workplace discrimination. People have to hide queer identity, stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're coming to a relationship at like a deficit. Um, and you're not starting at zero, where maybe people don't understand this person that I'm interacting with is like, it might feel like we're starting at zero because we haven't interacted before, but there's distrust there. And maybe I might feel like I haven't earned it because I haven't personally done anything, but the distrust or skepticism or hesitancy, the past trauma um, is there. And it might not be fair, it might not feel fair, um, but there is a certain level of trust building that has to happen first, even though you might feel like you're starting at zero. And it's one of those things where like, you know, um, like I remember when I first interviewed here, um, Sarah was one of the first people to come up to me um, and say, and she was in one of one or several of the committees um, that I interviewed with too. Um, and she like made a point of being like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm over here in this building. I'm tenured. I, you know, am, I, I think you called yourself an old coot or something, Sarah. And, you know, was like show, showed me your resist earrings and was like, I'm here to be an ally in whatever way I can. Like she basically said it that way um, and was like, you know, like, and, you know, like, like, let's hang out. Let's be friends. Let me know what way I can support you. And that was like a very direct way of signaling to me, like, hey, I want to be like this in this kind of relationship with you and in support of you right like let me signal this and there was another person who came up to me and wanted to talk and was telling me about like a family member of theirs um who has like a, a queer identity that they were um like just learning about and discussing that and to me that was their way of signaling to me like i'm an okay person to talk to you about like queer issues you know without being as direct about it as sarah had been with like i'm we're you know like i'm trying to be this type of person and friend to you and these are things that it's a kind of, it's not code switching exactly, but it's a way of signaling to people like, I I want you to know that I am a safe person to talk about with this. But what a lot of people don't understand is that's often not enough, right? Like you can signal like safe, like, a, like I'm a good person. I'm a woke person. I'm a like not racist person. I'm not a transphobic person, whatever. But then like there are like 
you'll be watching <laughs> to see what you do after that. Like what else, like that, that one time is not enough. Putting the sticker that you did safe zone on your door is not enough. Um, and that often it takes time and multiple attempts. Um, and um, they might also still decide, okay, well noted, but I'm still not gonna follow up on that. Um, and I don't know, like this is a conversation I've had several times over the last several months with people. And I realize it's something that in particular for friends of, for people that I know who occupy identities that have some marginalization, like we have some a level of understanding that like, you know, like if I'm a queer person and I'm coming up to some like, I don't know, like person who signals like they, they look like, there's nothing on them that signals to me whether or not they might be like queer friendly, right? Um, I'm maybe not gonna like come out of the gate talking about those things because uh, I don't know if they might be like have some queer misier or not, right? Um, and it's the same with other identities as well. Like you have to approach with caution. And I think for people who, you know, either don't occupy many op um, identities of marginalization and or have not really thought about what it may, might be like for someone who has a different kind of marginalization than they do, um, might not realize or understand or really um, um, have, like have thought about and parsed out how to approach building a relationship with intentionality and saying, okay, I have done my signaling, my virtuous signaling, you could even call it, which a lot of people use derogatorily, but that is what it is. Like it's a type of signaling to let people know like, hey, I'm like, I'm friendly to people like you. I'm one of you, right? But it takes more than just signaling. You have to like build on that. And it's the building, or I think people either one find it unfair that they have to do it at signal in the first place or in, are coming from kind of a deficit, or two are like, well, I put my trans zone, like safe zone sticker on my door. What more do you want me to do? Like them expecting, you know, ha still having hesitance or skepticism about me is unfair um, and unearned. Like I didn't earn that. It's like you didn't have to. And I think a lot of people maybe have trouble with that and I'll stop there. No, uh, Deborah, you highlighted a lot of things and for people to understand like, yeah, um, you might be starting up at negative 75 off the bat and you won't even know it. The person is not gonna come up and tell you this. Um, you can't expect people to automatically trust you. I do not trust any institution. I don't, and I don't trust most of the people inside of those institutions. How can I? For me, I think about, you know, these things, uh, you know, living on the mainland. And I was like, how, how, how mind destructive that it is to be living in the place that basically hates me for the color of my skin. And when we think about other oppressed and marginalized groups and identities, you know, and what they what they have to deal with in a day to day just to survive and constantly be building themselves up, um, that they do not want to take more of the time and energy to engage with people who might be benefiting from their oppression in multiple aspects. But when we think about race, you know? And so when we consider um, that you might have to work hard, you might have to prove that you're not, you know, like, as I remember someone was saying in a presentation I attended earlier this year, that the, that the application for allyship is closed. We're looking for co-conspirators. We're looking for abolitionists. We're looking for people who are willing to disempower themselves to empower other people. But we're willing for people to actually understand that there's no checklist to this work. You know, in the last two hours, I basically asked you all a lot of questions. Why? For us to think and assume and challenge this world that we have grown up in, that sometimes we have, um, engaged in unchecked, unquestioned, you know, without reflecting on it um, and building in spaces for that, not just temporarily, but going forward. You know, when we, when we think about like what it required to do this work, is for you to take apart all the aspects of your life, you know, and, and really look at it and see where race and racism came into play. And understand that for some people, they may not be looking at you as an individual, but just looking at you as part of a larger system. 
And for people, for me, you can talk a pretty story, you can say all the right words, but in the end, um, if you are not there, um, if you're not angry when I'm angry, if you're not fuming or crying or, 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 or you know, supporting the work that I'm doing, there's some points where you're either for or against. There's certain points where, you know, you may never get to solidarity. It may never be your friendship. It's just gonna be, you're just gonna be colleagues and have a functioning, <laughs> working relationship with that person. But when we think about going forward, thinking about this, if we are wanting to move forward to a place that is anti-racist, that is welcoming and inclusive, that is equitable, what exclusionary practices are we still doing and that we need to get rid of? When we think about how we are engaging with one another, are we accepting that people have boundaries and they may take time to develop themselves? And I will also, um, what I'll do, um, I'll send to Deborah, um, is some racial identity development models that exist that can allow you to be able to figure out where you are in terms of your racial identity development. Because this is key, um, I believe, to the work that we're doing. But even just thinking about our own identities, in particular, plural, thinking about um, our own racial identity, but also thinking about how, for some folks, they will never trust you. They will never engage with you um, in the way that you want them to do so. And we have two minutes left and I just wanna double check the chat box. I think it's more difficult for black folk, but especially black folks open up to white people because literally at any moment they can weaponize the tears of fragility to literally ruin their lives. The stakes of taking the chance are much higher. I think like 5,000 times before I uh, open up um, in many situations and cases. Um, and so really thinking about uh, how we are approaching these relationships, um, thinking about how other people, um, how we are approaching others, how others are approaching us, um, but thinking about it when it comes down to it. It's not in the moments of calm and um, when everything seems to be going along okay that we're gonna need people. It's one of those moments that flares up um, when statements are no longer enough, um, we're checking in with someone um, right after they spoken up in a meeting and saying, oh my gosh, this is great. They don't need the whisper allyship. And that is from Dr. Brittany Cooper, you know, um, that we actually need people who are able to understand that their privilege, their power, um, their knowledge is being used to help make it a safe-ish place. So with that, we have 30 seconds. Yeah. Or it's no a line. It is three o'clock now. Mine still says 259. Oh, never mind. My clock is about one minute fast. So um, I hope you all got something from this um, that you're able to think through a little bit more about uh, relationships, um, <coughs> sorry, partnerships, um, that in order to get to community and coalition building, we have to work in those first three things first. And we can't jump to that um, without working on ourselves first. We can't change the institution and these systems if we are not willing to change ourselves for us. And as far as I'm concerned, I know I have a lot, a long way to go. Thank you, and same. Would it be helpful? I noticed in the chat, there were a couple of, th like when we were talking about, um, um, like Patrick's, um, like, where are you from? And, you know, not realizing, oh, there's a, a lot of ways that people might have had that said to them that um, would cause them to hear that and have knee jerk like assumptions about why I'm asking, even though I totally didn't mean it that way. And there were other things too, people were mentioning in the chat. I think Patrick and Suzanne were talking about how like the, um, you know, like, 
are you married? <laughs> like, do you have children? Like things like that, that some people might think of as just like totally innocuous and like, it just didn't occur to you why that might be like difficult or triggering or offensive and all of that. Um, and I know, you know, like, I'm certainly not, I'm sure that I've put my foot, you know, in my mouth many of times as well. Um, so I don't know, guys, like, would it be helpful to have some kind of like session for our next UL VLC to have it rather than something so structured, have something that's more of a discussion of like, like things like this, you know, like, like things, people, like, I don't know how to, I'm, I'm just thinking about it now, but would something like that be helpful? Um, like just an open discussion about, you know, I, I don't know, like, like, don't say these things <laughs> or no, um I, I think about it like in terms of like conversation like you know yeah. um, traditional questions that are asked you know and, yeah. and and thinking about like why they traditional or or have been normalized to this point mm -hmm. um that you know people ask these questions with a self and thought and then when people respond in you know in a different way that they are taken aback from it because I think like you know some of these things I think about that I'm trying to carve out of my way of thinking to be like, I don't need this question. It's like when we do surveys, it's like, do you really need to collect this? No, you mm -hmm. don't. You know, so like thinking about like how we engage with people, it's like we don't need this, we don't need this information. Like this is this is this is this is this is extraneous information that we don't need in this case. Bulbasaur. Um no it's it's speedy. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I'm just like, I'm just putting it out there as, you know, I don't know if that would be helpful. And yeah, the inclusive language or inclusive conversations or being a mindful conversationalist, like maybe something more like that. Anyway, I it was just the thought I had because of the, 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 um, engaging chat convo that we had. Um, anyway, if you guys have thoughts, um, on that, um, or how we might maybe do that, or if you're like, oh, actually, could we do have a session where we talk for 15 minutes about this instead? Because I really want to delve more into it. And so far I've only been able to like, have, like pop a thing into chat and one person responds. I would really love to have more of a conversation about it. Um, I think that would be great. Um, we're approaching summer now that May is over, um, you know, a June session that's more, that's less structured and more just like um, more talky um, <laughs> might, might be good for everybody. Um, anyway, okay, so we're a few minutes over for sure, even on my clock too. Thank you so much, Twana. We really appreciate having you here. Um, <laughs> um, everyone else, thank you so much for attending. Um, I guess we can turn off the recording now. Um, and yeah, everybody have a great rest of